Good evening, everyone. Happy Friday tea time, uh, or happy Friday, whatever time it is, wherever you are at. I've already managed to. I, I was I wasn't in a rush tonight for some reason. Um, I managed to get here just in time to pour a beer before I hit the go live button. So, cheers, everyone. It's nice to be back. Let's have a look who we got in. Uh, Colin Falcon, how are you, Colin? Phil Simmons, Chip Young. Derek Clacton, Peter Collins, Anton uh, Truman's in, uh, Timbo, Patrick's in, Jason, Deco Dude, Brad Matthews, Anton, um, all the regular faces. Um, Ozzy's in. How are you, Ozzy? Um, yes, so I'm just uh, going to waffle for a bit, uh, roughly the next hour, basically. <laughs> um, Deco's in. How are you, Deco, mate? Um just um, just while we're letting the ads get out of the way and everything, as you probably saw from the title of uh, the stream today, um, you know, it's it's tax return time of year, isn't it? Certainly is for us in the UK. <coughs> it's always worse thinking about doing it than actually doing it. <coughs> you know, I, I, um, I've been kind of noodling away with it kind of doing it all this week and uh finally kind of dotted the i's and crossed the t's on it all this afternoon um and uh so little bit of a bill to pay but never mind these things happen um so uh paying higher tax rates shows you have the money um yeah i'm not on the higher tax rate <laughs> <laughs> um it's uh but you know i suppose you've got to chip in a bit haven't you especially t uh at times like this um uh did i mention my missus got one of your t-shirts john wear with pride i haven't even got mine on at the moment it's um i've worn it that much um that it's um, it's getting a bit threadbare, so I should really kind of order myself a new one. I have to pay for them, same as everybody else, um, so I should really, um, you know, kind of get myself one. I wouldn't care, I bought a load of them as Christmas presents for people and forgot to get another one for myself. Um, right, so yes, uh, let's get the, um, the important stuff out of the way. Uh, this week's groceries came from Morrison's. Um, I think I've got one convert to the old Morrison's export uh, lager this week. Um, you saw me going shopping for it the other day, if you watched the um, the uh, the video uh, that I did. Uh, what was it? Yesterday, uh, where I was uh, having a wander around town. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the positive, overwhelmingly positive response to that video, by the way. Evening, Saji. How are you, mate? Um Evening, uh, Lee. Evening, Sean. Um, oh, Sean, you've got to do the Mrs. Tax return, have you? Yes, well, time's getting on. End of the month, mate, you know. Um, it is much easier to do it online these days because, you know, do you remember having to wade through the paper form and you think, well, am I supposed to do fill that page in or am I supposed to skip that page? And... <clears throat> You know, so then you, you know, you're kind of looking through the little leaflet that tells you what you're supposed to do, and it's all written in taxman speak, isn't it? <clears throat> but nowadays, you just, um, you know, you just click the next button, and it automatically takes you to the next thing you need to do. Evening, David. How are you, mate? Evening, Nigel. Evening, Derek. Um, yes. Anyway, uh, let's have a quick rundown of what's coming up on the channel this week. Um, Tomorrow there is a video on, um, well, the video is called Turning Gary Upside Down. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, it does, of course, feature my favourite guitar player, Gary Moore. Um, and there's, uh, it's basically just a little uh, thing called melodic inversion or chromatic inversion that we're looking at. And it's a great way of um, just basically coming up with a new idea for a tune and um it's uh, it works really well uh, so that's tomorrow's video um monday's solo analysis video well if i just tell you um uh the commodore's guitar solo 
then you probably know which one I'm talking about. Um, so any guesses on that one? Uh, Tuesday. Now, Tuesday is a bit of a special video. We are going to be uh, once again interviewing um, the absolute genius that is Steve Hoggett. I haven't seen him in yet, nor that maybe he's in, maybe he hasn't joined us yet, but um, I'm going to be doing another interview with Steve Hoggett because there was a lot of stuff in the first interview I did uh, oh, a couple of months ago that we never got, got around to talking about. So we shall be, uh, it's a bit of a kind of a, a structured interview this time though. Um, you'll see what I mean uh, when, when you see it. That's what's going up on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we are going to be looking into the possibility that Johann Sebastian Bach um, actually helped to write what became a reggae classic. Then on Thursday, um, I've noticed a few YouTubers doing um, kind of video. I'd Shane from In The Blues did it um, a while ago, or ju just the beginning of the year, actually, uh, where he kind of just laid bare his entire guitar collection. I wouldn't call what I've got a collection. It's just more of a toolbox, but I'm going to be kind of... Uh, having a bit of a roundup of uh, what guitars I've got, uh, what the stories are behind them, and and all of that kind of gubbins. Um, so uh, that's Thursday and Friday. We're back on the beer again. Uh, that's the one, Anton. <laughs> yes. Who played it, though? Who played the solo on um, the Commodore's Easy Like Sunday Morning? Um Anybody who knows will say, and anybody who doesn't will furiously be Googling it. <laughs> How did Bach like his donuts with jamming? Jamming, yeah, okay, fair enough. You hear it all week, aren't you, Jason? Don't forget to tip your waiters. Um, hey, hey, dear me. So, what kind of week you all had then? Um, What's that, Deco? John, enjoyed your town vid. Could we see more of the old buildings and a better look at uh, that old anchors? I mean, uh, intended in our story, not... In, oh, okay, in, interested in history. Yes, um, uh, I shall be doing another um, another kind of walk around town and uh, showing you some of the other sites, um, mainly because yesterday's video seemed so popular. Uh, evening, Sean. Um so, evening, Matthew. How are you? Um, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Bob Holness. That's another. <laughs> I know where you're going with that, mate. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the old Bob Holness Baker Street urban myth. Um, no, it was uh, a chap called Thomas McClary or McClary. Not sure. Um, yeah, I saw that. Uh, I, I saw Dave Simpson had uh, turned up back in the UK. Um, you know, it's, um, I don't know. I guess he'll tell his story when he's, um, when he's ready to, uh, to, to say so. Thank you, Anton. Um, is it true that Gary Moore was left-handed, but learned to play right-handed? Yes, indeed it was. And, um, Mark Knopfler, the same, he's left-handed in everyday life and played right-handed, um, and plays right-handed rather. And, um, I saw, oh, dear me, uh, many, many years ago, there was, if anyone remembers the South Bank show that used to be on TV, um, there was a kind of an episode of that on Jimi Hendrix. And in part of that episode, there were kind of, um, you know, home movies that they'd, that they'd taken on like 8mm film when they were on, when the Hendrix experience was on tour across the States. And there's a couple of shots in there that I, that struck me straight away of Hendrix signing autographs, and he's signing autographs right-handed. So was he a right-handed player who played left-handed? Um, interesting. Thank you for confirming that, Sergi. I I always wondered if he was if he was uh, right-handed in everyday life. Interesting thing. My foot. The first time I ever picked up a guitar before I. Um, learned to play the guitar. Um, our music teacher at school was very keen on this. I'll probably be, well, I started playing when I was 11, so it was before that. Uh, but used, we used to have this guy who used to come into the primary school and give us music classes. And um, 
there were a few of the, you know the obligatory kind of nylon string classical guitars and they were handed out and we were kind of playing i think it was um some folk tune that had like a c and a g chord in it and you know you can play a c chord with one finger on the top three strings and a g chord the same you know that kind of thing um well i intuitively as a right-handed kid you know who'd never picked up a guitar before just picked it up that way because i assumed my right hand would be doing all the kind of th that kind of stuff so i don't know maybe um maybe hendrix uh was that way inclined i don't know um Tony Iommi is also left-handed and plays right-handed. Well, I, th I think Tony Iommi plays left-handed, doesn't he? I'm sure. Um, um, <laughs> he could write with either hand. He was amphibious. Um, uh, hi, John. I was wondering if you still uh, had days you picked guitar uh, sounding brill next day sounded crud. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um you know, I mean, I pick up the guitar <coughs> every day and think, you know, kind of, I've got fingers like pig's trotters here. You know, it's just, it, it just, some days it just doesn't work. You know, when you see any of these um, kind of solo analysis things that I do where, you know, there's an artful kind of shift of camera angle halfway through the solo. Oh, let me tell you what happens about one second after that uh, <laughs> after that uh, camera angle change, right? I mess up. I get it wrong, and I have to kind of punch in and, and kind of do it again, and the camera is at a different angle. Um, so that that's usually what that means when I do that, when, when you see the, the, the camera angle shift. Um, and, you know, it's just some day... Some day, what's that uh, Die Straits song? Some days you're the windshield, some days you're the bug. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's very much true of me. It's, I mean, I, I I am always I've learned to be gracious in accepting a compliment, but it's still a bit of a struggle because I really, really don't kind of like listening to my own guitar playing. The hardest thing for me is if I'm um, recording and mixing a piece of music that I've played on and then I have to sit and kind of listen to it as I'm mixing it and stuff. I hate doing that. It's, I, I just kind of, oh, don't know. Um, but, you know, if other people like it, then fair enough. Evening, Craig. How are you, mate? Uh, yeah, I thought Tony I only played left-handed. Um John, your thoughts on Motley Crue? Um, well, they were of their time, weren't they? You know, it was all that sort of um, LA Sunset Strip kind of, um, you know, glam metal. And um, it's not my favourite genre of music, but, you know, they were you know, the preeminent band in, in that genre, really. I mean, you know, the, the, they were the ones that sort of, maybe Kiss before them, I guess. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'll admit to, you know, kind of when a Motley Crue tune comes on the radio, I'll tap my foot and, and enjoy it. I don't dislike them, but it's just, it, it's all a bit, all that sort of stuff, really. It's unfair to single them out as a band. Um Yes, all right. Fair enough. Do you want a, a flake in that pint? Um, um, you know, all, all that sort of 80s kind of uh, spangly glam metal, it's all a bit too sugar-coated for me. Um, as I said, I don't dislike it, but it, it wouldn't be my first choice to listen to. Um uh, Saw a comment in Jimmy Harrison cover video where someone said, amazing to play without mistakes. He replied, with all honesty, he's had to do hundreds of takes before posting the vid. Yeah, you see that, if you go back to some of my earlier videos, like from, um, oh, I don't know, maybe uh, 2017, 2018, back then, um, I would think that, you know, I've got to do it all in one take, and I would spend sometimes maybe an entire day just playing and playing and playing to get the perfect take. 
And um, I, I, I listen to, I'll, I'll watch those videos now. And um, is it, it's, I think, yeah, that's got no spontaneity or life in it. It's just I'm, I'm kind of reciting the solo rather than playing it. So I prefer to kind of just go for it nowadays and then just if i need to fix a mistake and kind of punch in and you know change the camera angle and, and it uh, ironically i think it makes the videos look better because you know it gives it gives the videos more dynamism and, and sort of movement if you can do that sort of thing uh aussie skill aussie skillfully Avoided all that hair metal nonsense, mostly. Yes. Well, um, you know, <laughs> hair metal is kind of off off the agenda for me, really, these days, isn't it? Although I used to have a mullet. I did back in the eighties. It was just obligatory. I think there was a law passed, wasn't there? Um, you know that you had to have the um, you know the kind of short back and sides up here, and then the kind of you know the uh, the, the 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 mane at the back. Yeah, Rick James, he does some good stuff, doesn't he, Craig? Yeah, I didn't see that video where he shows all his mistakes. I think I should probably, um, I'm big enough and ugly enough nowadays to kind of uh, be able to do a blooper reel. That might be a, um, a video that might come up at some point, you know, like, like you get on the DVD extras when you buy your box set. Um, You just got your turntable going, have you, mate? Yeah. Uh, well, I stand by. That's Deco talking about his uh, his vinyl addiction, presumably. Um, as I said, you know, I have um, absolutely no desire to go back to the days of vinyl. I do. I kind of miss, you know, the album covers and everything. Um, you know, but um, at the end of the day, for me, it's about the music. It's about the notes. It's about the harmony. It's about the rhythm. It's about just that. Immersing yourself in the music and you know just having a a nice picture to look at is well, it was a bonus, but it was it was like kind of a side benefit for me. It's you know if I can avoid the kind of pops and crackles and hisses and uh, you know kind of skipping needles and stuff like that that you get that was always my experience of vinyl. Then uh, you know I'm perfectly happy with that. <laughs> Steve Vice hair metal these days, days suits us all the fellas better. Yes. Um, having said that, I mean, I'm a massive, massive Joe Satriani fan. And I remember, you know, with bated breath, um, kind of getting that, um, that Vi album, uh, Passion and Warfare. And think this is going to be fantastic, you know, because it. I, I was expecting it to be, you know, like Steve, like like um, like surfing with the alien or something. But you know, Steve's take on that. And the, the problem I had with that album, particularly, why I don't think I've ever bought another Steve Vai album, is it suffered from that that kind of malady that many albums did around that sort of early nineties time which was the CD had, you know, was capable of holding 75 minutes worth of music. So record companies wanted 75 minute long albums. And for me, there was just too much filler on there. Um, the, the good tracks on there, I really like, you know, I mean, for the love of God and Liberty and the audience is listening and, you know, a few other tracks on there, but it was just, it was a bit rambling. And um, you know, I, I've never been, uh, I've never revisited his his work since then. Although I do love, I love uh, Steve's playing in, and probably this is uh, a bit of a contradiction from what I was saying about eighties hair metal earlier. Um, I do love his playing on, you know, Skyscraper and Eat Them and Smile, those two David Lee Roth albums that he did. Um, you know, fantastic. I mean, Yankee Rose, play me a, a, a more. A, a better guitar track than that. Go on, a day. What's your thoughts on Ingve Malmsteen? Well, here's here's a little anecdote that I often share with people about Ingve Malmsteen. Um, I bought Rising Force back in when, whenever nineteen eighty, whenever it was when it came out, and I bought it on vinyl. 
I remember having to um, order it from um, some music shop in the Lake District where I lived at the time in Windermere. Um, can't remember what it was called. Um, anyway, I ordered this vinyl album, and um, it, uh, I, you know, the, the the wait for it to turn up, and I got it, and I got it home on the bus ride, you know, all the usual sort of stuff where you're looking at the album cover and wondering what it's going to sound like. Got it home, put it on the turntable, started listening to it, and was absolutely blown away. But by the end of side one, I was bored. Um, and, you know, I don't think I ever really listened to side two. Um, so, you know, he's a, fa- I mean, you say what you like about the lad, you know, he's, he's a absolutely gobsmackingly talented musician. You know, he just is. Um, but I think he's one of those guitar players. And I, I would apply this to Steve Vai as well. That you know he need he he really needs the discipline of being in a band, um, where you know he's he's given his kind of, you know, chance to shine on the big solo on the big outro or something like that, you know, but then it but it's it's kind of reined in a little bit. It, I think it's just a bit too, I don't know. It, it just doesn't do it for me his solo stuff. But um, I remember what was that band he had with uh, when he was uh, with uh, Graham Bonnet. Alcatraz. I remember having that album and um, being like really, really impressed with it. And his solo stuff, not so much. DME Vincent. Yes, I do remember that show, the Guitar Legends show in Seville in 1992. DME, was that 30 years ago? Uh, that was a hell of a show, wasn't it? You know, you had Brian May, Joe Walsh. Steve Vai, I think Nuno Betancourt was there as well, wasn't he? Um, you know, Joe Satriani, B.B. King, um, Phil Manzanera, you know, just, I mean, what a lineup! And, you know, just incredibly uh, fantastic. I remember uh, having that on VHS, you know, kind of um, recording it on, on VHS, just in mono on the little kind of portable TV that I used to watch it. I used to have it back then. Fantastic stuff. Favourite blues rhythm, rhythm, Green Onions is mine. What's yours, John? Favourite blues rhythm guitar part? Now, there's... Um, I would have to say, as a, as a blues rhythm guitarist, uh, it would probably be... Um, it would have to be something by Wilco Johnson. Because uh, that's like... That's just rhythm guitar, lead guitar, the whole kind of band all in one player, isn't it, really? Uh, favorite Wilco track. Um, it will be something recent, actually. It will be off um, that album that he did with Roger Daltrey back in 2014. You know, the um, Going Back Home. That's an album I never ever tire of listening to. Um, yes, Rock School on TV. Um, you know, fantastic, fantastic show. Can you imagine that getting on TV nowadays? You know, just a rock band in a studio kind of showing you how to be in a rock band. And here's how you play a solo. Here's how you play a drum break. Here's how you kind of play bass lines. You know, it, it's the sort of thing that I guess nowadays is on YouTube, but it just seemed more more precious and more kind of uh, valuable back in the 80s when that was on TV because, you know, we had no YouTube or internet or anything. It was just, there it was on TV. And it was, um, I remember my dad was a farmer um, before he retired. And um, he was always into all of those farming programs that were on TV on a Sunday lunchtime, you know, farming outlook and w- what have you. I guess they eventually ended up kind of morphing into something like Country File that we've got on TV now. And, um, you know, after these farming shows, you know, you'd get, um, what was she called? Deirdre Cartwright. Um, you know, the guitarist in the, in the band, you know, she, she'd be on there and she'd be playing some blazing solo. And, <clears throat> you know, there was a, they used to do it like a blues episode and a metal episode and a reggae episode and a fusion episode. Fantastic, fantastic show. Very, very happy memories. Excuse me while I just click this message that I've got on screen here. A Java update is available. Yes, I'll do it later. Go away. Um, 
Um, PRS must have been cheaper then. Yeah, PRS didn't exist, did it, till 85. And this was like, I think, 83, 84. Um, you know, um, dear me, I'm, I'm just beginning to realise how old I am anyway. Always happens when I've had a beer. I always get maudlin. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, that's two down and two to go. Excuse me while I refill. Um, big fan of the tube of the tubes that old strap the guitarist used sounded great. What what a show, John! Yes, yeah, it it really was. Um, and as I say, you know, um, I think a lot of the problem these days, and you know, it's because I've been ruminating on this over over Christmas. Um, The, the Christmas TV in the UK this year, I thought, was absolute, absolutely appalling. There was just nothing to watch. Nothing that you wanted to watch anyway, certainly in our house. So we spent the whole of Christmas on Amazon Prime and Netflix. Loads of choice there. Always found something to watch, you know. Um, you know, and plus we've got like loads of DVDs of old classic films and stuff. So we, we, we watched a few of those. Um, but it, it occurred to me, is it, is the reason that there was nothing that you could, that, that was worth watching then? And this is all, all, all over Christmas. Is it because there's just too much choice nowadays and you're kind of scrolling through stuff and oh, I don't fancy that and I don't fancy that and I don't fancy that. And you end up watching nothing. Whereas once upon a time when there were like four channels, you know, you just kind of settled onto something and you thought this'll do. And you know, you enjoyed it anyway. Um, so it's, it's easy to be nostalgic about the old days when there was, uh, you know, kind of less choice and, uh, perhaps because there was less choice in them days, it made it easier to find something that you were happy with. I don't know, a bit philosophical. Um, <laughs> who's that bugger? John is ahead already. Not finished the second yet. Keep up, Phil. Keep up. You know, I usually bring four upstairs with me for the um, for these Friday evening sessions, and then there's um, another four. Well, there's another twelve downstairs, um, which you know how I just get through as many of those as 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 I feel like doing. You know, on a on a Friday, and um, you see, I've got this amazing amazing ability to as long as I don't mix, as long as I don't go from beer to wine to whiskey or anything like that. I'm usually okay the next morning, which is um, infuriating for the missus because she has two stiff sherries and she's um, she's in, in bed all the next day. Yes, I have seen Night of the Guitars, Wishbone Ash and Alvin Lee, among many others. I remember that well. Um Where are we? Danny Kerwin, yes, indeed, fantastic player. Um, have you watched Utopia on Prime, John? Uh, watch the British version; it's very topical with today's climate. Is it? I haven't seen it yet. Um, no, I tell you what, I've been watching, um, rewatching because uh, you know it's. I can watch it as many, many times as as I as well forever, basically. A um, couple of shows, uh, Sons of Anarchy, um, watched all of that over Christmas, and um, what's the other one, Breaking Bad, uh, I mean, two of the best TV shows ever made, I think. Have you ever drunk around the optics in a paint glass? Uh, yes, yes, I have. Um, that happened on my 18th birthday. <laughs> um, where are we? I just watched your old vids over Christmas and made a guitar out and made a guitar out of leftover turkey. Whatever, mate. Yeah, Breaking Bass, Breaking Bass, Breaking, I've got beer on the brain. Breaking Bad was class, Colin. I agree with you. It's just what I love about that show is. 
just this transition from mild mannered uh, chemistry teacher to badass gangster. Uh, you know, it's just so well written, so well performed. You know, it's um, it's just a masterpiece of television. Yes, she did, Sean. I seem to remember in series two of Rock School, Rock School, about four years after the first series, Deidre spoke about uh, how lovely and expensive her PRS was. Yeah, yeah, I'd forgotten about that series. I see the first series is fixed in my mind because um, I was still living at home then uh, with Ma and Pa. And by the time the second series came on, it was I was in sort of student accommodation, and um, you know. TV was, um, well, you know, there was one TV amongst about 12 of us. So, you know, occasionally you ought to watch it. I missed most of the second series of Alfida's in Pet because of that. Um, watch the Ozarks. Watch Ozarks on net Netflix. Awesome. Yes, uh, the wife's got into that, but that was one of those, that's one of those shows that she watched when I was, wasn't kind of, you know, watching TV a lot and she's sort of seen it all. So she won't watch it again. So I've got to kind of, kind of try and sneak it in, uh, when she's not, um, when she's not, you know, kind of, uh, in a TV sort of mood. Uh, yeah, Chris, I agree with you. I keep seeing those, um, Toyer and Robert Fripp videos, uh, cropping up in me, uh, suggested videos. And, um, you know, she's, um, you know, she's not looking her age. Let's say that. Gary Moore did a rock school type program on with Jack Bruce on YouTube. I shall have to check that out. Uh, anything, um, anything with uh, Mr. Moore in it. Yes, Jason, James May in, J in Japan is hilarious. Um, you know, it's, I, you know, I feel like, I, well, my missus says me and James May were separated at birth. Put it that way. Draw your own conclusions. Uh, no, never seen that one, uh, Brad. Uh, vinyl. Um, I, guess, I guess it must be about the record industry uh, or the music industry. Um yeah, Deco, I saw the first few episodes of Better Call Saul and I just couldn't get with it, you know. It was just, it just seemed a bit like, what was that series that they did um, after Friends, you know, where kind of Matt LeBlanc got his own series. As, was it was it just called Joy? And it was just like, yeah, it, okay, yeah, you, you're trying to kind of milk it a little bit here. Uh, it was like... Um, when when porridge ended, you know they did that sort of um, that follow up with Ronnie uh, Ronnie Bark, you know where Fletch was out of prison called Going Straight, and it just wasn't as good. Um, is Robert Fripp any good on the guitar? Well, what do you think? I mean, you know, <laughs> of course he is. Um, you know, he does have that. Um, weird tuning though doesn't he which uh paul davids did a video on uh didn't he recently that, that new standard tuning where let me see if i can remember it's c g um d a uh e g um you know which is just he, he called it the new standard tuning he expected i think it for it to take over from you know, the regular kind of get standard guitar tuning. Evening, Peter. How are you, mate? Um, evening, Steve. Um, and uh, guitarists the world over kind of tried this new tuning or read about this new tuning and said, no, thanks, Robert. But, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, um, it's good to have original kind of thoughts every now and again, I suppose, but... Um, you know, not for me. I tried it once and didn't like it. Um, uh, 
Hi, John. You didn't expl explain the Helter Skelter at Red Cassie from... Might be interesting for the viewers. Right. Long story short. Um, there was a campaign because Red Car used to have a pier, like a seaside town, and it got... Well, I think it had two piers anyway, destroyed in storms and stuff. Um, there wasn't money to build a new pier, so they came up with this idea of a vertical pier, a tower, um, which is what they ended up building. And it it won some kind of carbuncle award for bad architecture. Um, a lot of people in Red Cam whinge and moan about it. But here's the thing. Um, before they the sort of broke ground to build it, there was a set of local elections around here, you know, where you, you elect the local councillors. And I can't remember which party it was because I don't pay a lot of attention to this sort of stuff. But one of the parties, one of the mainstream parties, Labour, Lib Dem, Conservatives or whatever, said, if you elect us to, to control the council, we'll scrap this project. And their share of the vote went down. So everybody in Redcar who moans about that, um, about it, you know, well, you had your chance to, to kind of vote to get rid of it or to not have it built, you know, and it got... <laughs> and... Um, you didn't take it, so. Have you thought about creating a new tuning on the guitar? Uh, no. Um, it's, you know, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I know Tom Quayle uses um, a, a slightly different tuning, doesn't he, where he tunes, um, he gets rid of that sort of step between the second and third strings where it's tuned in a major third rather than a perfect fourth like all the other strings. Um but, you know, it's just I learned to play the guitar in standard tuning and, you know, everything. It's like I was saying, like when I did a video ages ago on, you know, slide guitar. I use standard tuning for slide guitar because, um, you know, it's, as I said then, all of the notes are where I left them, you know. Um, yeah, exactly, John. Uh, Tom uh, Tom Quill tunes in fourths. Um and, uh, you know, it's just like I would have to relearn all my chord shapes. I would have to relearn all my scale patterns. And it's like, it's, no, it's just I've got better things to do, you know. Yeah, Robert Fripp isn't too bad on the guitar, it has to be said. Um uh, it does have a decent bar in the vertical peel. I've been there's a radio station up at the top of the um, of the red car beacon, as it's officially called, um, and um, I was interviewed on there about the. Remember a couple of years ago, I did the uh, was it not not last Christmas, the Christmas before, um, I did the um, charity single for um, Zoe's place, and um, I was on on the radio. There, they played my tune. Well, Roy Wood's tune, anyway. Um, anyone tried the Tom Quayle app? I didn't know he had an app. Um, why change the tuning? The same notes are there regardless. Well, yeah, the, the thing, I mean, I was listening to an interview years ago. Does anybody remember a show that used to be on the BBC called The Transatlantic Sessions? where it was basically like a bunch of British folk musicians and a bunch of, um, you know, American country musicians, and they would just kind of put them in a hotel in um, the Hebrides or somewhere, somewhere remote, northern Scotland anyway, and get them jamming and record the, the, the results. Fantastic show. Um, and John Martin was on there, and th what he was seeing in one of the kind of little kind of interviews as as part of that show was um he used to use alternate tunings a lot because when he was playing unaccompanied it made sense to have like lower tuning at the bottom end of the guitar and higher tuning at the top end of the guitar so you had great range so you could you know it was there was more sort of um you covered more octaves basically which i guess makes sense but um for me, no. I'm just maybe I'm just lazy. I just I just know where everything is in standard tuning, and um, it's uh, oh, Transatlantic Sessions is on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, if anybody's um, at a loose end and you want to fill an hour or so, if it's on YouTube, go and check it out. 
Um, you sound like me, John. I like some things left alone. It's like the reverse headstock. Uh, I didn't like that. Seems daft to me. It looks awful. Now, as you may know, I used to have a guitar with um, a, a reverse headstock, the Harley Benton Cabernita Telly kind of thing. And I always thought it was a bit of a gimmick, a bit of a sort of um, kind of Hendrix badge of honor sort of thing. But uh, one thing it did do was because your top E string is now on a reverse headstock is now your shortest string. It reduces the tension in that string. Uh, which makes big string bends on the top E string, um, you know, easier. Do you think uh, Mesa Boogie amps will suffer from for Gibson buying them and stay authentic? Well, Gibson don't uh, Gibson don't really have a good track record for um, being custodians of companies that they buy up, do they? I mean, Cakewalk springs to mind. For many, many years, Cakewalk was my uh, Cakewalk Sonar was my go-to DAW, and um, then Gibson bought it, and suddenly um, the update stop, and eventually it's just you know it's not worth having anymore, um, you know because it's it, which is why I made the switch to Reaper a few years back. Um, that said, Gibson is obviously now under new management. We shall wait and see. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, boogie amps back in the in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, they were, you know, the, the, the Bentley of guitar amplifiers, weren't they? You know, if you wanted... It's, it's hard to imagine now, but back then, if you wanted, you know, a channel-switching amp that had more than just kind of clean and dirty, you know, if you wanted sort of three channels and a foot switchable boost there wasn't really much anything else other than boogie and um you know um it was just you know and the and, and this sounded gorgeous as well didn't they you know i mean you, you go and listen to you know any any santana album from from that sort of period um you know 80s and so on fantastic sounding amps um it's an amp I've never played through a boogie myself, actually. Um, it is a bit of a bucket list thing to do. So, um, John, can you name any guitar snobs? Um, plenty of them. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, I mean, all the people who use, usually comment on my Harley Benton videos saying that Harley Benton guitars should be banned because, you know, they, they've bought a Fender or a Gibson or a you know, a PRS, and um, suddenly a, a company comes along and builds something that's 99% as good for 10% of the price. Uh, hiya, Robert, how are you? I, I'm nice, to, nice to see you live tonight. I know you usually watch this on catch-up. Um, uh, Robert Bryant there, great chap in the States. Um, are you having a beer, Robert, or are you working? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Red Car is is a, is a nice place to live. It has, it's um, you know, like like any part of the world, there are it has its good points and its bad points. But there are probably I could count on the fingers of one hand the the number of places I would rather live. Um, you're a guitar snob, are you, <laughs> John? Uh, what's that? There's some, something just scrolled up the chat there, and I just need to go and grab it. So uh, let me just click on that. Um, what's your favourite band or player you've discovered last year? Oh, okay. Uh, what new music have I listened to last year? Um, good question. I'm just trying to think of, trying to be kind of, I can think of bands and players who I've listened to recently in the last few years who I've got into recently, but in the last year, I don't know that I, I kind of discovered any new uh, music from any, any new source in the last 12 months. But if we can broaden that out and say um, a band who I discovered 
relatively recently, it will be rival sons. Um, you know, so there you go. Uh, rival sons. That's as close as I can get. <laughs> yes, we've had the whole Toya conversation. Um, yes. Um, yeah, it's... Um, I think Harley Street might have been involved. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> um, yeah, Dave Simpson, not good for sales of expensive gear. That guy could pick up, you know, uh, a tennis racket and make it sound good, couldn't he? Um, I have a lot of time for Dave Simpson. I really do. Um just, I don't know if you saw that Anderton's interview with him. Uh, oh, that was probably last year. Um, he really did come across as the most genuine, down to earth guy who was, um, you know, he's one of those guys I don't think he knows how good he is. Do you know what I mean? Um, I, I, I will admit that some of his videos do go on quite a bit and, you know, you just think, okay, you know, you, you settle and you think, okay, here, here's another 20 minutes of uh, wah and fuzz. Um, you know, it's uh, possibly he needs to um, discover the, uh, the joys of the edit a little bit. But if you've got an hour to just sit down and watch one of his videos... <laughs> It's always a rewarding experience. I'm just speaking here because, you know, I have limited time to watch stuff. Um, so I often think, yeah, hurry up, Dave. I've, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm due to do a lesson in, in, uh, in, other, in another 10 minutes. Just kind of, you know, get to the point, mate. Um, yeah, he is a great, genuine guy. Um, I have buck teeth and can eat an apple through the strings of a tennis racket. Well, fair enough, mate. We all have our talents, don't we? <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on Guthrie Govan, John? Seems a nice lad. He can play just about anything and doesn't seem to have a big ego. Right. Um, Guthrie Govan is possibly, in fact, I would go further than possibly, I would say probably the best guitarist alive today. He just is. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, there is um, like a four-part video. I think it's just called Guthrie Govan, Words of Wisdom. And it's just him addressing a crowd. I think it must be at one of these um, American guitar schools, you know, like um, Guitar Institute of Technology or somewhere like that, where he's just sat there addressing this crowd, and he holds this crowd in the palm of his hand. I think there's part one, two, three, and four. Search him out on YouTube if you haven't seen them. He is entertaining. He is informative. He is, um, you know, engaging. It's just a fantastic way to spend about an hour of your life. It's, you know, and what a guy. Fantastic player. Very, very knowledgeable guy. And again, you know, doesn't, I think, know how good he really is. I didn't know some people did uh, have a dislike for Guthrie. Um, I can't see why. Well, I can see why, actually, in a single word. Uh, jealousy. Um, excuse me, I'm just taking me watch off. It gets to a certain time of the evening when the strap just starts to irritate me. Yeah, I mean, there are always people who are going to be, you know, um, resentful of anyone who is better than them, aren't they? You know, uh, the armchair critics. Um, oh, thank you very much, S. Wainscott. Um, discovered John Robson and Dave Simpson in 2020. It wasn't all bad. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to have brought a little bit of joy into your life. <laughs> um, what makes a great guitarist knowledge or feeling um, both um, and the whole sort of debate about whether you need to know theory 
which is, I think, what you're alluding to there, is, you know, it's it's a false kind of analysis, really, because, you know, if you know what sound, if you can look at a chord sequence or hear a chord sequence and know what's going to sound good over the top of that chord sequence or know what chords are going to sound good together in that chord sequence in the first place, if you just know that either by intuition or by experience or whatever, then that's all the knowledge you need, really. The, the whole kind of thing about theory, that, that debate, you know, you know, kind of, do you need music theory to be great at this, that, or the other? Usually that, that debate always centers around, you know, does this person... Um, know the textbook terms for this group of notes that they're playing as a chord or a scale or something like that. It doesn't matter. You know, I have to know the, these terms because I'm in the business. My, my livelihood is based upon conveying that information. And I've got to give this, this information like, 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 you know, this kind of this lick or this, this kind of run or something. I have to give it a name. So, you know, what am I going to do? Say, so, okay, the, the, this group of notes is called, Bob, you know, well, I might as well give it the name that it, that it has in the textbooks. And, you know, so I've kind of figured all that stuff out and read up on it. But if you're just in the business of being a musician and playing music, then as, as long as you have some understanding of what you're doing, then it doesn't matter whether you know the, the textbook th terms for it. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's all about whether you can, you know, look down at your instrument and know what to do in order to convey the, you know, the, the music that you're hearing in your head. Indeed, Nigel. Yes, I didn't know um, David had. Um, well, I sort of, I, I sort of knew he was a bit kind of. Um, he had one or two issues. I didn't know it was it was that uh, pronounced though. Um, I always put myself down because I can't play fast or know my theory. Uh, well, you know, um, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. You know, it's easier to access now than ever before, mate. And when it comes to playing fast, as I was saying to. Uh, a new student who, who started with me uh, yesterday, um, you know, who's specifically, you know, he want, he, he enrolled with me to, to basically said, I want to learn to be able to play some uh, flashy stuff. The thing is, it's all about muscle memory and it's all about just kind of understanding what you're doing. Um, often what slows you down on the guitar isn't your fingers, it's that nanosecond of, you know, oh, hang on, what do I do now? That that kind of is is the kind of curb that you trip over. So if you can get rid of that with a little bit of knowledge, and if you can, you know, just kind of meticulously, slowly, and fluently practice the things that you need to do with your fingers, um, then you just you just notice one day that, dear me, that was I, I played that rather fast, and. You know, it, it just, it, it happens. It is it is a little bit like watching uh, a kettle and waiting, waiting for it to boil. Um, I wonder how much theory Jeff Beck knows. Well, that again, that goes straight to the point of what I was talking about earlier. You know, does he know the textbook names for what he's talking about? Or does he just understand it based upon experience and intuition? Um, well, not even intuition, just experience, you know, knowing that this note will sound good here and I can connect that note to this note because that's the chord that's going on underneath, you know, and, and be able to see the, the, that kind of stuff on the neck. If you have that kind of um, that, that facility, then it matters not a jot whether you know that that's the mixolydian mode or the harmonic minor scale or, or whatever. It just doesn't matter. What defines a musician from someone who plays an instrument, John? Oh, no, you're getting into very deep philosophical waters there. Um, pr 
probably the best definition I can give is there was a, a chap who used to come to me for lessons. Um, oh, way back in the 90s, this was. And he was a, uh, I think he was a trombonist. Um, and he, he was a retired gentleman. And he wanted to learn to play the guitar just as another instrument, something he could have a sing song with his grandchildren, basically. And uh, he was a member of a Salvation Army band. And every Christmas, uh, him and his compadres in the in the Salvation Army band used to stand on a street corner in Middlesbrough and blast out the carols. And his mate, who I think was the cornet player, you know, had been playing Hark the Herald Angels Sing and Good King Wenceslas and, you know, um, all of the other Christmas carols. He'd been playing these tunes for 40 years. But if the wind blew his page round, he was knackered. You know, he couldn't, um, you know, he, 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 he was lost. So that, for me, is the definition of someone who can play the instrument, someone who, who knows the, the, the technical moves to make but doesn't really, um, you know, kind of get the musicality of it. Will there be time for a fifth pint? Well, there will be, but it won't be um, it won't be happening uh, on the live stream because um, I'm starting to get a bit hungry and there's a curry downstairs just waiting to be warmed up. Um, where are we? Uh, what defines fast? Fast to me is just like a blur and can't see the point. Yeah, here's the thing. Playing fast, it's it's something. If if you want to know when to put a fast run into a solo, just listen to what the drummer's doing. Okay, the drummer will always put a crescendo, a good drummer anyway, will always put like a crescendo or a kind of twiddly tickety 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 little fill um, at some point in the song where the song needs it to build, you know, some kind of degree of tension. That's where you play your fast guitar on, you know, or it, it's just a way of kind of, you know, getting from one main point of focal point of a melody to another part of a melody. And it, it, if all it, it's garnish, basically, it's, it's a way of, you know, kind of decorating what's going on. And, and if your entire piece of music is just that sort of um, those kind of fills, those flashy garnishy bits, then it goes back to what I was saying earlier on about, um, you know, Ingve Malmsteen. Um, you know, when he was in, when he had the d discipline of being in a band, you know, it was, you know, of being in somebody else's band. Let's say it, that that's when it, it used to th those kind of flashy bits used to kind of serve the song well, and then suddenly it's like he can do an a whole album full of these um, these these flashy kind of fills and. It, it suffered as a result of it. Okay, bang on drum, John. Drum fills. Never thought of it like that. Um, well, <laughs> it's things like that occur to you when you spend all day, every day, doing nothing but having to come up with ideas for students, basically. Um It's important to know what you wish to do with knowledge before trying to acquire it. It's like folks who say, I wish I could draw. It must be so relaxing. Try doing it on a deadline. Yes, um, I mean, that's Pete there, Peter Shields, axe caricaturist, the guy who does that, that little kind of caricature of me that you see in all the videos. Fantastically talented artist. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, ultimate respect to you, Pete. I, I had a go at kind of, a few years ago, I decided I wanted a hobby that wasn't music related. So I took up um, watercolour painting and uh, realised I was absolutely awful at it. Um, so there you go. Anyway, chaps, I'm almost at the end of my final beer. We've been on an hour um, or thereabouts. And I'm getting hungry, so um, I'm going to go head off downstairs 
for me, Curry. And once again, everyone, thank you so much for turning up. We're here every week. As you know, Friday, 5 p.m. UK time. This is now a regular fixture in my, just in my kind of social life, really, which says something about me. So thanks, everyone, for turning up. And uh, hope you all have a good week. Great video coming up tomorrow. Uh, love to see you uh, in the comments section of that. But till then, I bid you all a good day and say time, gentlemen, please. <laughs>